Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, as for me, it's almost midnight where I am. As uh, Simon was just telling you my location, it's, uh, it's a small state in the northeastern corner of India called Mizoram. In fact, we are sandwiched between Bangladesh in the, uh, in the west and Myanmar in the south and uh, east. And uh, from my name, a lot of you must have guessed. I'm ethnically a Gurkha, and he said a fourth generation Indian. I'm honored and privileged uh, tonight to be here on the Western Front Association's webinar to talk about the Indian Labor Corps. I must thank uh, David for the invitation and Simon for hosting the webinar tonight. At the outset, uh, let me tell you, I'm no scholar, nor an academic or a writer. I'm just a, a, an enthusiast who just got interested in the First World War. And hence my work is very simple. It is open to scrutiny and dissection. And as a, uh, as a lay researcher, my, 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 uh, my uh, talk is very ordinary and it lacks the, the kind of structure that academics and, and scholars are used to. I got interested in the First World War due to a family connection I have. My maternal great grandfather was a rifleman in the erstwhile Lusha Hills Military Police Battalion, which today has become the first battalion of the Assam Rifles, which is India's oldest paramilitary force whose origin dates back to 1835. Now he was attached to a Gurkha unit on the Western Front, I think uh, a Gurkha regiment, I don't exactly know which regiment, because I hardly have his papers and we were really poor in keeping records. So, but then he, he did come back, I think somewhere around in 1916, 17, he served in the Western Front. And I have another relative, a great uncle of mine who died in the Burma campaign in, in, in Burma in 1942. So being an, uh, an Indian Nepali with Gurkha ancestry, both the world wars remain subjects very close to my heart. Tonight, as uh, Simon told you, and the, the, the topic of my talk here is the Indian Labor Corps. I will be talking about the Indian Labor Corps in general, and I must thank uh, Professor Radhika Singha here tonight because she is she's an authority on the Indian Labor Corps, and she was kind enough to, to, to share her seminal work and, and her writings on the Indian non-combatants. So my focus will be on more on the Indian Labour Corps from my region. As Simon just said, I live in the northeast corner of India. And it is from these hill areas that around 10,000 uh, tribesmen were recruited as labor under the different Labour Corps in 1917. It's a very hilly region. And it is, uh, as I said, it is bounded by Bangladesh, Myanmar, and China. And, and surprisingly, a lot of you will be, will be very surprised to know that this region has more in common with countries and cultures in Southeast Asia than with India per se. And I, uh, I just uh, have put up the, uh, the, the political map of India so that you can just get uh, the, an, an idea of where I'm located. Um, estimates say about, uh, I think, uh, 1.4 million Indians participated in the First World War with about uh, a little more than half a million making up the various rank and file of the non-combatants, the majority who, of who served with the uh, Indian Labor Corps and also as followers in the colonial Indian army. Now this was more than one third of India's contribution of men. Now, India, as all of you know, contributed the largest voluntary army in the history of any conflict anywhere in the world and uh, and, and uh, this number would be replicated in larger numbers uh, in, during the Second World War as, as I think all, all of you know, even in bigger numbers, India contributed men during the Second World War. Uh, Indian soldiers served with credit and honor in all the theaters of the First World War, whether it was in France or Belgium, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, Persia, and even uh, Russia and even China. So during the course of which I think they earned about 9,200 decorations, uh, which included 11 Victoria Crosses and, and they suffered about 74,000 casualties, I think. 
Uh, by late 1917, the war cabinet realized that uh, the shortage of labor might cost them very dearly in the Western Front, in France, and in the Mesopotamia campaign. Now, as the war progressed, combatants could not be spared for non-combat roles, especially in the Western Front, and labor was needed ever than before in the Mesopotamia campaign. The devastating losses at Battle of Somme further exacerbated the manpower crisis on the Mesopotamian front. And uh, even I think after the long and humiliating siege of Kuth in, in December 1915 to roughly about April 1916, when uh, the offensive was really to get back positions and, 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 and get back the positions, the, the, the need for men was ever greater than before. So the war office was forced to look for men elsewhere from its colonies across the world and even from a neutral country like China. So uh, besides a lot of non-combatants were also needed in the Indian Army's logistical and support services. Now in the slide there, you can just see the various roles in which the Labor Corps were engaged. Uh, George Norton in his book, The Indian Empire at War, notes that from 1914 to 1916, the Indian non-combatants of which the Labour Corps and the followers were also a part, uh, served everywhere, wherever the Indian troops went, uh, supporting them in various roles and capacities such as cooks, bakers, kneaders, vegetable gardeners, laundrymen, carpenters, stretcher bearers. I mean, you just name it, doctors, vets, grooms. Now, most of these workers were already integrated into the military structure, which was known in the Indian army as the follower system. And they followed the regiments and uh, uh, the, the, the units wherever they went. Now, some of these men also worked with the skill combatants who were known as the pioneers, the sappers and miners. So in this, uh, in the, in the, in the slide that I've just shared, you can see a group of bakers, some men who are shoveling materials for road repair. Then another picture you can see of uh, on the railway tracks, perhaps this one is Mesopotamia, and also uh, a group of men tending to the wounded. Perhaps these are men of the uh, of the one of the specialized corps, maybe the hospital, the army hospital corps, I believe. Uh, the mules, uh, talking of uh, the 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 the. The Mule Transport Corps, of, of course, uh, the, the followers were divided into two classes, public followers and, and private followers. And uh, I think Brian Corrigan in one of his talks here mentioned about it. Now, some of these non-combatants were very specialized. For example, the Mule, in the, the, the mule Transport Corps, uh, you had the Army Hospital Corps, you had the Supply Corps, the Camel Corps. And, and, and this, in this picture here, you can just see the Indian Mule Corps at Gallipoli. So the Indian Mule Corps played a very important role in, Galli in Gallipoli in 1915 during the campaign there. As you can see from, from the picture, these mules transported ammunition from the beaches to the battlefields of the peninsula. Now this often put them in grave danger. And because of these, this, uh, this services, I think, this corps was recognized as combatant troops from 1917. Before that, they were non-combatants, but because of their services and being exposed to the dangers of the front line, I think they were recognized as combatants from 1917. Now here, I, I would like to mention that even though the labor, the, the men from India worked sometimes very close to the battlefields, the, they, the, the, some of them even lost their lives from the shelling, the gas attacks, but they were not recognized as combatants, unlike European labor, who I believe were regarded as combatants. The Indian Labour Corps were distinctly different from the other non-combatants, because as I just said, the, the, the non-combatants, especially the, 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 this, uh, the, the, special, the followers and the specialized ones, they had the specialized roles to perform. But the Labour Corps did not have any kind of uh, specialized skill roles. So they had to work, uh, so they had to work in whatever roles they were assigned to. So in this regard, the Labour Corps did all sorts of job where manual unskilled labour was needed 
such as building roads and railway tracks, handling ammunition, loading and unloading at the docks, manning the supply and storm depots, doing forestry work, working in the quarries, uh, building huts, um, uh, digging trenches, graves. Now these were the areas where you could not spare soldiers because you were already short of men. So you had to engage men from the, from the labor corps and, and get them from, uh, from places like India and even uh, uh, China, as I just said. So the, uh, in, in fact, uh, in the picture here, you can just see, again, the slide that I've just shared, the, the, the various roles which the, the labor corps did in France and in Mesopotamia. One of the pictures, uh, men try, uh, helping out to, uh, to cremate the body of a comrade, uh, then some of the forestry work, making charcoal in France, again, a group of men uh, building, road, uh, building a road in Mesopotamia. Now in, in India, there was already a system where uh, the, 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 this uh, porter corps or labor corps was already recognized as some form of labor because the overseas expedition where this coolie corps was used was first in Abyssinia in 1868, China in 1900, and I think Somaliland in 1904 to 1909. And even in India, uh, especially in the Northeastern region, which was uh, terra incognita for the British colonizers, because our part of the country, which is the Northeast India, was the last frontiers of colonization of the British. In fact, um, as late as 1917, there were still areas very close to the Indo-Myanmar border where you, where you still ha had head, head hunting being practiced. So, in fact, the, the, the British used to send punitive missions to these areas, and one such punitive mission were, was the Abor expedition of 1911, I think, which they sent uh, to punish one of the tribes in present-day Arunachal Pradesh. Here they used the services of about 2,000 Naga and about 1,000 Lushai tribesmen just to carry supplies because it was so dense, uh, very dense jungles, Normally soldiers could not go, so the tribesmen knew the way. So that's why the tribesmen often, were often used as coolies in, in, in the expeditionary and punitive missions. So even before the start of the war, the system for military expeditions was already in place. And, and perhaps this made recruitment for the, uh, for the labor corps easier because they had a new name, labor or porter corps, because the coolie corps was kind of the, uh, a, a derogatory, uh, not a derogatory term, but it was the lowest level of, 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 of the armies, of the, of the, not the military structure, but in a way, yes, the military structure because they were helping the, the, the military. So uh, the Indian Labor Corps served mainly in two theaters, in the Western Front in France and in um, Mesopotamia and Persia in the largest numbers. Of course, they did serve uh, in, in small numbers in, in, in some of the, the, the other theaters. Uh, Professor Radhika Singha, in one of her paper, writes that uh, the Indian Expe Expeditionary Force B, which was sent to uh, East Africa in, in, in November 1914, was the first uh, force that the railway, I mean, it had a railway coolie corps and a supply coolie corps, but uh, because of the manpower crisis in Mesopotamia, this were diverted to, to Mesopotamia, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, they were raised for Gallipoli, but this were diverted to Mesopotamia. And uh, these were the earliest instances of the services uh, that we can really record of, 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 of the men of the Indian Labor Corps. The, the, the demand for Labor Corps was placed, I'm sorry, there are, uh, just a, a small goof up. So the, uh, the demand for labor corps was placed to India from the early part of uh, 1916, I think, uh, where the majorities were recruited for the Mesopotamia campaign because uh, the recruitment for the French, uh, for the Western Front in France did not happen until the early part of 1917, in the spring of 1917. So the labor corps, in fact, the labor corps recruitment for uh, Mesopotamia did not stop even after the war. Even as late as 1920, 
uh, in the year 1920, there are reports that about 17,000 men were recruited uh, for la as labor corps to help in the rebuilding of the occupied territories of Mesopotamia and Persia, and to work as laborers for the powerful Anglo-Persian uh, oil company. Now, records in the archives of India show that sometimes the civil administration did not see eye to eye with the army department's camp, uh, uh, steps to, uh, to recruit men for the labor corps. They often cited violations of the provisions of the Indian Immigration Act of 1908. Now, this was an act which was enacted to, to safeguard the, the rights and uh, the, the rights of natives. Um, and they had some form of protection like uh, the appearance before a protector of immigrants and also a medical examination. Now, uh, as I said, this act was enacted to control the huge amount of labor that went overseas uh, starting from the late 1850s, 1860s, till early 1900s. Thousands went to work overseas under the infamous indentured labor in British plantations across the empire, whether it was Fiji, Guyana, that's how you have the Indian diaspora population in these countries. Now, to, to circumvent this act, um, certain sections of, of this act were, were relaxed so that men could be sent out of India without, uh, uh, without getting into the nitty gritties of the act as a, as a war measure. And, and finally, in, in March 1917, the government finally put an end to, to, to this indentured labor, uh, uh, indentured, uh, uh, indentured labor and, and only under special circumstances, the labor immigration to Ceylon and the, the, the Federated States of Malaysia was allowed after the army department requested to put a hold to the coolie recruitment because the army department was afraid that if this, uh, uh, if, if natives went out to work as laborers, in, in, in the plantations, I mean, you could not really find men because even in 1916, they had a lot of difficulty finding the required number of men. Uh, let me just get a, excuse me there, my throat was a little parched. And uh, since I speak a little fast, I hope you can catch on with me there. So uh, the men who served in the labor corps came from various corners of India. Now this is a, a, a map, a, a political map of the Indian empire where the yellow ones are the princely states and the slightly reddish one are the, are the British provinces. Now I will not go into the contribution of the princely states and, and stuff like that because that's again a huge chapter of India's contribution in the first world war. So as I said, the men who served in the labor corps, they came from various corners of India uh, I'll just, uh, they came from uh, the, the, the north, which was the United Provinces, which today are the states of Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand in the north, Bihar and Orissa, which you can see in the map somewhere there, then Bengal in the east, and the hills of Assam, or where I am located presently, which today has become the eight states of, uh, in the northeast, we have eight states actually, so I'll not go into that. But uh, I will cover this part later because I'm going to talk about my special area of specialization, which is the, the labor corps from Northeast India. In fact, you even had uh, the recruitment of labor from the Khyber Pakhtunwa province, which is somewhere, uh, I think, you can just near to Afghanistan on the map, very close, which today is, is uh, which in those days was called, I think, the Northwest uh, Frontier Province, and today it is the Khyber Pakhtunwa province. And some of them even were recruited from the Chin state of present day Myanmar. Now in, in early 1916, when coolies were recruited for the flood protection works in, in, in Basra and also labor for the military railway construction, uh, contractors were employed because uh, they could get men to be recruited and uh, they were employed to recruit uh, laborers and to some extent, even something like the, the, the regimental networks were also explored, uh, but this system failed to generate the required numbers. 
And, and Radhika Singha in one of her uh, paper notes that in 1916, in the autumn of 1916, the combatant and, uh, and, and non-combatant uh, recruitment was centralized under something which was known as the, the, the adjutant general. Now quotas were allocated on a territorial basis and revenue officials, headmen and chiefs were deployed more forcefully to assist in the recruiting process. In, uh, now in 1916, when adequate number of laborers could not be found for recruitment, the government even discussed impressment uh, from the non-martial classes, but it was uh, dropped. There was a lot of discussion, but it was dropped because of fear of public outcry. Uh, for the recruitment of sweepers, now the sweepers were among the lowest, they belonged to the, to the lowest caste community in India. And uh, in fact, mm, men of the jail and porter corps, the majority belonged to the sweeper class. Now for the recruitment of the sweeper of sweepers, who I, as I said, belonged to the lowest class, the help of the, the Salvation Army, you will be very surprised that the Salvation Army, in fact, uh, helped in the recruitment of sweepers because these, many, these sweepers came from the various uh, criminal tribes uh, who were um, the criminal tribes in those days uh, who were put in jails and uh, the Salvation Army helped in the enlistment. In fact, in 1916, Indian jails were tapped for the supply of labor and porters to Mesopotamia and about 16,000 convicts, which included 405 juvenile convicts, were recruited for seven porter, uh, for seven convict labor and porter corps for service in Mesopotamia. And as you can see in the slide here, which I've just shared, so this is a slide of uh, men of the jail and porter corps working on embankment, uh, embankment on the river Tigris in Mesopotamia, I think. Now, uh, the reason why I share this picture is because, uh, I'm sorry, the picture is not very, very crisp and clear, but it has a big story to tell because uh, there is documentary proof that children as young as 10 to 12 years old were recruited by, by the unscrupulous Indian civilian contractors and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the recruitment uh, uh, agencies because the contractors were the recruitment agencies. Now, Walter Lawrence, who was the commissioner for the sick and wounded uh, Indian soldiers in France and England, in one of his reports to Lord Kitchener, he noted with dismay when he saw that young children as young as 10 to 12 years old had been recruited. So this is a very powerful picture. Of, so whenever uh, a powerful picture of the Indian participation comes to my mind, this is the picture that comes to my mind. You can see a young child of perhaps just 10 or 12, it's looking very lost. And I think he was employed as records say, as a, a, as a bellow blower. Uh, in, in, in January, 1917, when, uh, uh, when, uh, when more men were needed for the Western Front and the, the Secretary of State wrote to the Viceroy, uh, Viceroy asking if India could supply men and labor for the Western Front in France. Now, while the big provinces like Punjab, Madras and Bombay were already drafting and the martial classes from Punjab, uh, Rajasthan and other areas, the, the United Provinces were already, I mean, they had sent so much men that you couldn't find really more men to be recruited as, as non-combatants. So the onus of providing labor, especially men for the labor corps, fell on the less represented provinces like Assam, Bihar, the Northeastern provinces, as we just talked about. So in case of Assam, the Assam administration through the chief commissioner, Archdale Earl, I think was his name. He was very quick to respond. He said, we can offer about eight to 10,000 able able-bodied men for France. Now in Assam, the, in, in Assam among the tribal areas that were under a, a, a loose form of British administration because the, the British, uh, unlike the rest of India, the British had, uh, I mean, they did not have a very strong, they didn't have a presence, but the, they did not have a grip, that kind of a grip which they had in the rest of India as in the Northeast India. 
So there was already an administrative and tributary structure in place through which the British placed demands for coolies, for portering and road building, and even for, as I, as I just discussed, the, expedition, the expeditionary and punitive missions. Uh, these were regularly placed to the tribal chiefs by the administration. And it was perhaps this policy that the chief commissioner might have counted upon to generate the required numbers. So in early 1917, calls for the Labour Corps in consonance with the Chief Commissioner's directive were circulated by the superintendents of the hill districts of Garo Hills, which today is a part of Meghalaya, the Lusha Hills, where I stay, that is Mizoram today, Khasi and Jaintia Hills, again, a part of Meghalaya, Naga Hills, which today is the state of Nagaland, and by the titular King of Manipur through the Manipur State Darbar, to the chiefs and men to recruit men for the labor corps. Now, as I said, these hill districts were the last frontier of colonization of the British in India. They were very sparsely populated and Christianity was just making inroads. I mean, as late as, uh, uh, because Christianity just started making inroads in some of the, in some of the areas as in 1890s and, and even early 1900s. So, <coughs> And in the recruitment of the, uh, of the labor corps, especially from Northeast India, the missionary, net, the missionary networks was really used and employed by the British because they had the, the, there is a missionary publication which was called Nongliam Christian in the Khasi Hills. And there was a governmental monthly publication to which uh, missionaries also contributed called Mizole Vai in the Lushai Hills. Now these publications eulogized the chance to go to France and they exhorted the men to enlist because they said, it's a chance for you to go and see the world. The Welsh missionaries were working in the Lushai Hills and Khasi Hills. The American Baptist missionaries who were working in the hill areas of Manipur and in the Garo Hills. The Belgian and surprisingly, even the Belgian Jesuit priests who were working among the Santhals and around in the Bihar and central provinces. As I said, they aided the recruitment and, and some of them even accompanied the Labour Corps to France as supervisors. Now you'll be surprised that uh, in, in Shillong, where, which today is the capital of Meghalaya, you had the German Salvatore missionaries doing mission work there. In fact, in, in 1915, they were expelled from the Khasi Hills and interned in one of the internment camps, which was set up for the German prisoners of war. Now the participation of around 9,000 men from the hill of what the British call the Northeastern frontier is, 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 uh, is a very epochal year for the history of these men because uh, ironical as it sounds, these areas were called, the, uh, the British called them the excluded areas. Now, um, Indians were in fact not permitted to enter these areas. You had to, had, you had to have permission and it was a very epochal year, as I said, because it marked the first contact with modern civilization and it and on a, on a large scale they they had uh, they, they 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 saw the modern world en masse now never in the history of these tribes had so many men got together in one place and and in those days i think a chief because they were all small small chiefdoms and a chief having 2000 subjects was almost unthinkable because the the men of the labor corps from Northeast India went in, in these groups of about uh, 2000 men each were again subdivided into four companies. Uh, we'll come to that later on. Now in the local constructs and oral narratives of tribals of Northeast India, this event of going uh, of 1917 is etched as fighting the Germans or going to the war or the journey to France. Now all these tribes, the majority of them had fought very violent wars with spears and rudimentary firearms against the British before they were uh, loosely brought into the form of British, the administration of British India. So in a way, this might have been natural for the men to think of them as going to war because their fathers and grandfathers all had fought fierce wars with the British. And maybe to some extent, they still had this sense of, uh, of, of, of uh, going to war. Maybe they thought uh, that they would be going to war. Now, these uh, the subjugated tribes 
were very poor. And as I said, um, the enticement for recruitment was exemption from payment of house tax and forced labor. Because uh, in uh, the British levied a house tax which ranged from rupees two, uh, rupees two to three per year. And there was also the forced uh, labor which uh, the hillmen detested. Now this was a chance uh, for them to be to be free of the for, to be free of this because the uh, anyone who recruited uh, who, who went as a, who volunteered to go uh, to be recruited in the labor corps was exempt from the payment of house tax for life and also from forced labor so this is a certificate of exemption which was given to the men once they came back from france so this is uh, i think perhaps one of the the ex the certificates of exemption of a person who was with the Manipur's uh, the Manipur Labour Corps, so that's why you you can read the Manipur state. The rest is not very clear. If you can just read, uh, exempted for life from payment of house tax. Pothang and Bega were the name of the forced labour in the vernacular there. So this system of exemption uh, and the exemption from house tax and the payment uh, and forced labour, I think they were very special en enticements for them to be recruited. Now in September 1917, when another fresh requisition for, uh, an, uh, for, um, for another company of labor corps was placed to the hill tribes, especially the cookies of Manipur. Now the cookies of Manipur revolted. They took up arms against the, the Raja, the Manipur, the Raja of Manipur and the British. And this, uh, this, uh, this event was fought for about two years this, uh, the, which is called the, the Kuki Rebellion or the uprising and in, in local, it was the biggest uprising by any tribal group in Northeast India. Now you also had uh, the, the Santhals also rose against, uh, there was also an, an, an uprising by the Santhals of the princely states of, of Mayurbhanj in, in Orissa, but this was quickly put down now uh, and then I think as I said because these areas were very remote areas I mean even as late even after independence as late as 1960s 70s even 80s the northeastern part of India was really remote for the rest of India now uh, if you can just uh, see, see the slide there you can see the uh, this is a slide, uh, which, uh, this is taken from the official publication of India's contribution to the Great War, which was published by the government of India in 1913. So it lists out the number of labor and porter companies which were raised during the course of the First World War, France 54, Mesopotamia 19. And you can see in those, I mean, because in Mesopotamia, the, the labor strength differed uh, in, in France and Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, the labor strength was roughly about 1,200 men, and you did, uh, we, uh, there was no porter corps in, in France, and uh, you only had the porter corps in Mesopotamia and a few other uh, theaters. Now, this is not a very accurate estimation of the number of labor companies. In fact, uh, the total is 104 companies, but the number of companies is perhaps far, far greater. I think perhaps it, it, it numbers around uh, 130 plus. Now you can also see the theater in which it is uh, theater in which employed the India, twenty companies because uh, in the Indian uh, not the Indian section but you also had uh, Afghanistan in the northwestern frontier province they were also pulled in some form of the First World War and uh, the uh, I think the, the spillover of the First World War through the Afghanistan route was also there and that's why you have the the, uh, the, the, the 20 companies who served in, in a part of India, and that's why India is, uh, I think, written there. So as I said, for the Mesopotamia campaign, you had about uh, roughly uh, 1,200 men. Now, the arrangement was slightly different for France. Each of the labor corps from Northeast India, the Lushai, the Naga, the Khasi, the Manipur Corps, each had about 2,000 men, while the Garo and the Chin from Burma had roughly a, a thousand men each. And um, 
in, in, in May 1917, um, just a month uh, before the arrival of the Indian Labour Corps in France, Lieutenant Colonel Amtel uh, was made the labour uh, was made the labour advisor. So initially for France, uh, a labour corps of 2,000 men with three European officers was suggested, but uh, Amtel decided that such an arrangement would not fit the requirement for France. So the Indian Labour Corps was reorganized in companies of 500 men each, uh, each with their own office establishment similar to the British labour companies. So for every uh, labour company, a uh, labour corps let me, uh, of, of 2,000 men, there were supposed to be three British uh, commissioned officers. Since Indians were not eligible for officers commission, uh, the government added civilians as supervisors for companies of, of 500 plus men because uh, each company, as I just said, had 500 men. And uh, the supervisors for these uh, companies were drawn from the educated Indians the Eurasian and European, uh, the Europeans. In some cases, even British tea planters, and I, as I just said, even the missionaries were drafted as supervisors. The Indian non-commissioned officers uh, from the regular army officered the lower ranks. Now you had uh, headmen, assistant headmen and interpreters and mates from among the tribes. They were also appointed and they were chosen because they had played a very important role in, in recruitment and some of them wielded a great amount of influence as chiefs. In fact, uh, you, in the, in the Lushai Labour Corps, there was a chief for each of the four labour companies. So uh, let me just uh, have... Sorry about that. So in 1917, 18 companies were raised uh, in, from the Assam province, and uh, you can see the composition there. And uh, from the Burma province, five were raised, Chins from the hills and Burman from the, uh, the agriculture classes of Upper Burma. From the Northwest Frontier province, you had four companies. Uh, from the United Provinces, 18 companies. Now 14 of them of, were mixed class composition and four were from the Kumaon belt. From Bihar and Orissa, you had 15 companies. Again, majority of them being the mixed class companies, but, uh, but you also had the Santhals and the Orans, the tribals. And also, uh, it's very interesting that the word Ranchi, in fact, Ranchi is a town in, 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 uh, in Jharkhand today. And because the, lab the, the laborers came from that area and they were given the label Ranchi Labor Corps. And you also had uh, two companies from Bengal, uh, you, and you had Bengali Christians, again, Santhals and Muslims from, and from, uh, from East uh, Bengal there. <clears throat> now the Indian labor companies were reorganized in August, 1917, and eventually they were numbered from, <coughs> excuse me, the 21st to the, 20, to the 85th. And it was during this time that the labor companies acquired a more ethnic label, such as the, the Khasis, the Garo, the Naga, the Lushai, the Chin, the Burman, all from Northeast India, the Santhal and Orans from Central India and Bihar, and the Kumaon labor from North India. Now, uh, this is a slide, if you can just see, of men of the Lushai labor corps learning to march. And as I just said, the, the Lushai Labor Corps was made up of uh, 2,000 men divided into four companies. Initially, they were called the 27th Lushai Labor Corps. And, but it seems that this, later, this, this Labor Corps was later split up and numbered as 26th, 27th, 20, 28th, and 29th. And then uh, the next slide is of the men of the Naga Labor Corps. Now you can see that this was just, uh, this picture is, 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 I think, just after they had been recruited before they left for France. You can see them all dressed up in their traditional clothes with, uh, with, with necklaces and, uh, I mean, you, you, and, and all bare feet. And uh, we had the Khasi Labor Corps, again, which was known as the 26th. They also had uh, four companies and the men of the Langa Labor Corps again had four 
companies and uh, the Manipur Labor Corps also had uh, four companies each. But as I said, the Garos had just two companies, the 69th and the 84th. Now, just coming to the, the pay and service conditions. Now, the prisoners who volunteered to go to Mesopotamia in the jail and labor corps, and they were enrolled as followers under the Indian Army Act, and they had to, uh, the, the term of service was for two years or for the duration of the war, whichever was earlier. And uh, the unexpired period of their sentence was suspended and was to be remitted when they returned. The, the convicts received rupees 10 per month as pay. They received fee, uh, free food, clothing in every six months, a bonus equal to a month's pay. While the monthly wage of a free porter or labor corps in Mesopotamia was rupees 15 per month, which in fact reached 20 with allowances and it was linked to a wound and injury pension and even a family pension in case of death. Initially, these benefits were not extended to the convict, uh, to the convicts, but I think a little later on, they, these benefits were also extended to the convict laborers. And among the convict laborers, they were subjected to military law and punishment was not uncommon. Uh, whereas the labor companies that were sent to France in 1917 were just engaged for a year, the laborers were paid, in this case, 20 rupees per month, a little better than double the pay of the convict laborers. Now, there's something called mates, and mates supervised 30 laborers each. They were, uh, uh, they were a little above the, the laborers, and they were paid 30 rupees per month. The assistant headmen and clerks who assisted were paid rupees 50 to 60 rupees per month. And interpreters who were very, who played a very important role because they could understand English, they spoke the local language and they, they formed an important connecting link for the men they were paid rupees 75 to 100 per month. And the headmen were paid rupees 100 again, whereas the supervisors were paid 500 rupees per month. Now, once the, their one year term expired somewhere in, 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 uh, in, in February, March of 1918, they were offered an extension, but most of the labor companies refused and they sailed back to India by April, May, June, they were back in their homes. Now for the majority of the men, the journey to France by train from the hinterlands to the, uh, from the ports of India by ship from Bombay to Karachi to Marseille was an epic journey. Some of these experiences have been recorded by some of the writings, which I will talk about later on to uh, two, two chaps called Sainginga and Vompunga and another Kandre Shaiza of the Naga Labor, uh, of the Manipur Labor Corps who wrote about these experiences. And it is from these writings that we really know the kind of experiences that these men had. Now, I'm just going to, uh, this is a picture of a group of men of the Naga Labor Corps embarking from Bombay for the journey to, to, to France. In fact, the, the Naga Labor Corps, I think, disembarked somewhere in Taranto in Italy, and then they travel by train further ahead. Now, I just wanted to share about a, a small uh, incident which will tell you about the simplicity of these men. So when, uh, this is an extract from the, 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 the account written by Vompunga. So when about five, uh, 1,500 of them boarded a ship in, 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 in Bombay port, uh, they had never seen a ship before. And as more people kept on boarding, the, 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 the ship was sunk a, little, uh, sunk a little lower. And there was this uh, friend of his, choir, started weeping incons inconsolably because he was, he was feeling that the ship was sinking because uh, the, 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 when he looked at the jetty, the jetty lowered a little, little, a, a little less and because as the ship was with, uh, loaded with passengers, so definitely, I mean, you would be lowering yourself. He was afraid that they were going to sink. So this was the, the kind of experience that they had. I mean, he was, and then when everyone had boarded and the ship sailed, and they did not sink, he started laughing. He said, it's, it's, it's such a relief that we have not sunk. And uh, again, uh, for these men, this was the first experience 
of seeing the modern world. And when they had nothing to do on the ship, some of them scraped the paint from the ship and the captain of the ship remarked, it's no wonder I, am, I, am, I have a troop of monkeys on my ship. And when they reached France and they saw the wonders of modern civilization, they saw the cars, trams, trams caught their attention because you had these women traveling on the, on the trams. And when they saw these beautiful women, they named them beautiful boxes. They just gave them a name. And uh, there's a lot of letters which men of the labor corps wrote. And I just want to read out, it's a very poignant letter, which uh, a native preacher, Reverend Shai Rabu Manar, who accompanied the, the labor corps uh, to France, and this was published in one of the missionary publications in 1917. And I'll just read it out, quote, because he was already a native preacher by then. So what, this is what he writes, quote, what goes through the mind of someone who's left behind his home, his family, his land, and is now in a dangerous land miles and miles away from any comfort. My thoughts have matured so much already on this journey. I have crossed the seas and I've seen the greatest of the world and man. I have now seen his intelligence with my own eyes. I have seen the faith that I believe in, but I have also seen the devastation of this war. I have seen barren and desolate villages sigh. The war is terrifying. I can't wait it to be over. Though these were the kind of experiences the men had. Now coming to the kind of uh, the, the, the work that they did, the agreement with the Indian Labor Corps <coughs> did not specify the hours of work or rest days. We can infer it from the accounts of the men uh, that the, the, uh, the, the men wrote. In France, the men worked from, I think, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with a break in between for lunch. Now, Sundays were, uh, were off for the Christians who numbered about 5,000. There is a very interesting incident because in winter, when the men were given a weekly dosage of treacle laced with opium to help them tide over the cold and fatigue, missionaries strongly objected. They said, you cannot do this because you, you, you will take them back to the ways before we converted them. And, and I think even there was a, a somewhere in a church in Wales, the, the members of the church started uh, uh, getting funds for a cocoa fund because they didn't want the men going back to drinking. Uh, the working hours in Mesopotamia varied between seven and a half hours to 10 hours, but the day was quite long because um, Mesopotamia was, I mean, as the, 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 the daytime temperatures reached about 48 degrees centigrade. And sometimes, especially in Mesopotamia, since you had the, the convict laborers working, so they really made to work very, very hard. And only the festival, only a major festival day used to be a rest day. So uh, since a lot of these men did not possess uh, varied skills, they did a lot of loading and unloading, uh, I mean, uh, of stores, transport. Now, some of these uh, men did battlefield clearance and salvage, while other companies were detailed to road, uh, to road construction, forestry work, carrying ammunition, as we have said, uh, as we have talked about that. Now, the labor corps supported all sorts of construction work and supplied uh, men labor to an army that was already grappling with manpower issues. Now, had it not been for the labor corps, not just Indians, but the rest, I think the war would have been prolonged. So the services rendered by the men of the labor corps were no means ordinary. In fact, uh, Lord Amthill, the labor advisor, initially was not very enthused by the addition of the Indians, uh, of the Indian labor corps to the <clears throat> to the non-combatant category. But after seeing them work so hard, in January 1918, he argued in a letter, he changed his opinion. He said, these men have worked so hard, we should consider them combatants. But of course, the government did not uh, do that. And he was very instrumental in arranging because among the labor corps, you had very influential men, you had educated men. So he wanted these men to see the world because these, uh, especially among the tribe, the men had been recruited with the promise, with the, with the with the promise that come, I mean, volunteer yourself and see the world with us. So 
maybe Amtel wanted this promise to be kept. So he pressed, he persuaded the India office to arrange for visits of the Labour Corps to London. So about 260 uh, men of the Labour Corps, especially the, 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 the Labour Corps from Northeast India, they, uh, they, they were put in parties of 10 and uh, they were entertained for a will, full week in London. And I think some of them even had an audience with King George V. Now, the, uh, <coughs> William Lane, who commanded the Jail Labour Corps in, in Mesopotamia, he's written uh, extensively about the kind of work that they did, the kind of uh, a moral dilemma he was in, whether to punish them, because, <coughs> excuse me, the convicts said, we are free, we are, we've been offered uh, we, we've been offered service to come to Mesopotamia and you cannot just punish us. So the archives of William Lane have very interesting uh, areas of work of the, the jail labor corps. Now vernacular memories of Sai Hinga, who was a, Lushai, uh, who was a clerk with the Lushai labor corps, he wrote this book, which uh, is an account of the Nizos to France. And there's Another one, Kanre Shaiza, who, be, who was, a, who was a, a Tangkul Naga interpreter of the Manipur Labor Corps. This is the book that he wrote. And there's also an account of Vompunga. In fact, I translated some parts of this and presented in a, in a conference last year in, in Edinburgh when I'd gone there to present a, a paper. And there's a, a very interesting, another memoir called On to Baghdad, which was written by an educated Bengali, uh, Bengali, who worked as a stretcher bearer from, uh, for the Bengal Labor Corps. And I think uh, um, uh, Shantanu, Professor Shantanu, uh, he translated this from Bengali to, into English. Now these memoirs have, have, have really, are very interesting because uh, they, they offer us a first hand glimpse of what the modern world and what the war meant to these men. Now there were, uh, uh, and, and uh, there are letters, especially in the news bulletin, Lushai and Vai, which, uh, which is there uh, in, 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 in the archives in Aizol here. So I have these uh, letters where very powerful experiences are narrated by the men. The, new, the missionary publication, not only I'm Christian also has, the archives of this, uh, of this missionary publication has a lot of letters from uh, men of the labor corps now you had a lot of, uh, in Northeast India, we have these labor corps songs for every tribe because every tribe composed songs when they left after they came back. These folk songs are even popular today. One such translation, which I did for the labor corps is a song called German Ral Rune. I think uh, it's, it's, it's perhaps available on the net and I'm not very sure I did translation for the big ideas company when they did a resource pack for the un remembered. Now there's a very, uh, a friend of mine has made a, 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 a film, we did not choose one Frank Ding Dois's name. He worked for about three years, made this film, which is the first one on the Indian Labour Corps. Of course, his, his focus is on the Khasi Labour Corps, but no one's ever made a film on the Indian Labour Corps. Now war office figures from 1920, placed the number of deaths of the Labour Corps at about 17,347. Since records for the labourers were very sketchy, I definitely feel this is an underestimation. More, the, the, the casualties would have been much higher. Many fell to, to long range uh, shelling, to gas attacks, and many of them died from the, the Spanish pandemic flu and pneumonia. And we have these, uh, so this again is a, 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 a photograph, different photographs from the Imperial Museum. So this is in particular, I think in the Imperial Corps Museum, you have a lot of photographs of the Manipur Labor Corps. I think they were the most photographed of all the Labor Corps. And that's why I thought, let me just share some of the few pictures from the Imperial War Museum's website. Now in the, uh, so you have a lot of these graves of the labor corps scattered across France. Uh, the India Gate, which is the war memorial in the heart of Delhi commemorates 1147 men of the labor corps. Now there are more than uh, 1400, uh, close to 1500 graves 
scattered across cemeteries in Western Front. The largest one is, I think, in Maraz, in Mazargues, if I, I don't know whether I've got that pronunciation right, 430 of them. Uh, many of them are buried in Blages, St. Sirius, and Rouen, I think, again. And uh, the, on the screen, you can just see two of the headstones, one from the Naga Labor Corps, the second one from the Indian, uh, from the Lushai Labor Corps. Now, it's very interesting because you, they don't have surnames. They just have a single name. They do not have surnames because in the tribal areas, even today, people don't use surnames because there's a very strong tribal bond. So, for example, a Lushai, is, a, a Mizo, I mean, today is known as a Mizo, is a Mizo. A Naga is a Naga. A Khasi is a Khasi. And uh, now, uh, and uh, even in the United Kingdom, I think they're buried at the Brockhood Military Cemetery in Pasham Down. And uh, at St. Nicholas Churchyard in Brockenhurst is where Sukha Kalu, the sweeper, is buried. And I feel I must tell, and of course it's been a little long and thank you for bearing with me there, but I must tell the story of Sukha Kalu because it is a powerful illustration of the casteist prejudice that still exists and haunts present day Indian society. Sukha belonged to the lowest caste among the Hindu Indians who are even looked down upon today, they're called uh, the untouchables and they're called Dalits today. In fact, the name untouchables was given by Mahatma Gandhi because he wanted to reform the Hindu society to get them out. I mean, he wanted to do away with the, this, this, this practice of untouchability and that's why he embraced it. Now Sukha did not have a surname, but he did, the, but he did have a surname which was Kalu. In fact, I think he was called Kalu because Kalu in Hindi means black or dark skinned. He enrolled as a sweeper in the Supply and Transport Corps. And uh, I think he died in 1915 while assisting at the Lady Hartinge Hospital for the wounded soldiers in, 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 uh, in Brockenhurst. Now, when he died, his fellow Hindus denied him a cremation, saying that he's, he doesn't belong to our caste. And if we touch him, we will be we will, he will pollute us. And when the Muslims were asked to bury him, they said, we cannot bury him because he doesn't belong to our faith. So ultimately he was buried in St. Nicholas Cemetery, uh, St. Nicholas Churchyard at Brockenhurst. And the inscription on his headstone is very touching and it reads, by creed, he was not Christian, but his earthly life was dedicated or was sacrificed in service of others. Now, again, there's uh, uh, the Laskar Memorial in, in, in Calcutta commemorates about 800 seamen who lost their lives during the course of the First World War. And we have these memorials to men of the Labour Corps in various parts of Northeast India, in Shillong to the, to, to the Khasi Labour Corps, in Aizol to the Lushai Labour Corps, in Intura, in, which is in Garo Hills, to men of the Garo Labour Corps, and uh, the picture below where you can see a gentleman standing, that is the recent, because there was no memorial to men of the Naga Labour Corps. So when the chief minister of that state visited uh, the, on a visit to France, he happened to visit the, 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 the graves of the Naga Labour Corps and was touched. And he, when he came back, I, I mean, the Naga people decided that they almost, they also must have a memorial. And the, 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 the red memorial that you see has a very interesting story because among the, among I think all the people of India, among all the, the communities in India, the Garo community is the only community that still commemorates July 16th. July 16th was the day that these men returned to Tura. And this day, even today is celebrated as Labor Day. I think that this is the only community that still observes the day of return, 16 July, as Labor Day. Uh, the year 1917, as I said, is going to be remembered as a very epochal year because this singular event uh, transformed the sense of identity. It, 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 uh, how do I say? It gave them a sense of identity and it infused, it infused in them a sense of pride and bolstered the self-esteem of all things modern civilization, education, and Christianity impressed them the most. And there was a uh, political consciousness also began to dawn among these uh, tribes, especially among the tribes of Northeast India. And they set up 
these different associations, the, the Naga Club in 1929, I mean, the Naga Club, which was set up after this men came back, demanded in 1929 to the Simon Commission that their rights be safeguarded. In 1933, the Lushai intelligentsia, of whom the Lushai Labour Corps men were also part, they said, uh, the excluded tag must be removed and we must be given representation in the legislature of Assam. In 1923, the Khasis got together and formed the Khasi Darbar. Today, the Khasis, the Garos, <clears throat> the Mizos, the Khasis and the Nagas rank higher literacy than the national average on various developmental parameters such as health, education, and social security, they top the list. And, uh, and, and with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for bearing me out. And I think some of you might, must have had a problem following my diction because I talk a little fast. And before I end this presentation, I'd just like to share this uh, picture of uh, the inauguration of the War Memorial in Aizol, that's where I stay. So this memorial was inaugurated in 1923. And there you can see the, the, uh, this picture. I mean, my grandfather, my, my great grandfather belonged to this regiment, which was the, the Lushai Hills Military Police and which uh, became the Assam Rifles after 1917. The name Assam Rifles was given to this to these battalions because of the service in the Great War. And this is something which is very personal and, and close to me. So that's why I thought I should end this presentation by sharing this picture. Thank you, everyone. Pratap, thank you very much for that. That was that a was wonderful a long presentation. Sorry about that. I no, no, I no, no. Minutes, Could I, I ask can... people to please raise... Everyone. Could you stop sharing the screen, please, Pratap? Oh, right, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Um, if people could, in the usual fashion, um, press the button to raise their hands. Um, the numbers are, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, Pratap, but the numbers are rocketing. People are applauding you. you from afar. So thank you ever so much. Um, if you've got questions, thank you for Pratap, I know it's late where you are. It's probably oh, it's half past right. midnight. I'm, I'm, you're yeah. staying up late. It's, it's just uh, <laughs> past midnight, so it's fine. <laughs> Okay, no. if people have got questions, please use the Q&A button. We've had questions coming in already. So what I will do is, if it's all right with you, Pratap, I'll read them out for you to answer. Sure, sure. So uh, a question from uh, Christopher Weeks, who asks, did the Indian Labour Corps include soldiers who were no longer deemed fit enough to be frontline soldiers because they'd been wounded? Uh, yes, there were instances, especially... The community that I belong to, because I'm a Gurkha, so there are instances of Gurkha soldiers who were unfit for service. Uh, there are records that some of them had been recruited. And as I said, the, uh, in the Labour Corps, the Indian officers, uh, the, the, the Indian NCOs, the officer, the lower ranks, and, and some of these men also accompanied as the, 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 the Indian officer, the, the NCOs. Yes, uh, I think Christopher is right, because we have instances of these men being recruited as men of the Labour Corps, I mean, soldiers who were, who were uh, sent out of service because of injury or something like that. You have, we have examples from, I think, uh, the Kumau and Garhwal belt, because these uh, belts were uh, where you had recruitment for the Garhwal rifles mm -hmm. and from, again, Nepal, because the bulk of the Burkhas came from Nepal. So yes, we do have instances of these men being recruited. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Marie McCarthy asks, well, she says, what an excellent presentation, thank you. Did any females from India get involved in the war in a nursing capacity in the First World War? Mm, I am not very, very sure, but I think there's just one single instance, of course, I'm not very sure. This is, uh, this is of course, just uh, off my head. But uh, as far as I know, there have been none, but I, I have, uh, there might be one which I'm not very sure, but I, uh, as I said, I don't want to. So let's say that there were no women. Okay. But I think she has raised a very important point because I never thought about this, you know, that women also could be there. But if she's raised the question, I think she, she knows more than me. So I think she'll have to share with me. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, Bill Twist uh, says, you mentioned the caste system in your talk. Mm -hmm. how, impo how important was the caste system? 
and how did it differ between the various tribal or regional core? Uh, yes, um, as you know, I mean, all of you know that India is a very diverse country. And as I said, the region from where I am, the Northeast India, you have these tribal communities. So in tribal communities, there is no caste and caste class distinction. Whereas in the, the, the general Indian community, if I may say, where, of where you had soldiers, even, uh, even during the First World War, caste was a very important, strong factor. I think Brian Corrigan in one of his webinars uh, covered about this aspect where he said, uh, you had these Brahmins, soldiers also were recruited. And since the Brahmins, uh, the, I mean, the other caste did not cook food uh, made by the others and you only needed a Brahmin to cook food for the Brahmin. So later on after the war, this was, uh, this was a very difficult practice which could not be kept up. And I think the number of Brahmins were reduced greatly that in fact, I think a few years after the first world war, they were disbanded altogether. Yes, caste, uh, caste distinctions played a very important role in the Indian, Indian army because uh, especially you had the Muslim soldiers, the Hindu soldiers, the Hindu soldiers would not eat halal meat, whereas uh, the, 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 the Muslim soldiers would not eat the chadka meat, which you said the slaughtering like with, with, with a knife. I mean, sorry about the action. I mean, you have these different ways in which meat is cut by the community. So yes, we have been, it was very strong. It was a very strong factor. Okay, thank you. Uh, but the question come in from, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Ian Ferenc, or Ferenc, I'm not sure he pronounced your surname, who says, whilst recognising that there was so much diversity between the different units and religions and castes, is there a single diary or a personal account that's translated into English that best encapsulates the experience of serving in the Indian Labour Corps? Uh, unlike uh, the, 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 because you have a lot of uh, literature, you have a lot of diaries, journal, books written about the, the European participation, but we don't have a lot of, uh, of diaries which have been left by, even, even, even among the combatants, we don't have a lot of diaries and journals left and, 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 and very less for the Labour Corps. Uh, as far as I know, there's just this four uh, accounts, the one by Sai Hinga, which is, uh, who is, he, he belonged to the Rushai Labour Corps, the one by Kandre Shaiza, who belonged to the Manipur Labour Corps, the one written by Sisir Sarabdhikari. I mean, if, if, uh, if he can get a translation of, uh, of, of uh, the one done by Shantanu in his book, I think, Race, uh, Empire and the First World War, I think it's a, it's a Cambridge, uh, it's, a, it's a Cambridge or an Oxford University publication. So there you'll find the, the right, uh, the, 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 the translation of Sisir Sarabdhikari, which is quite uh, a, a very um, an encompassing one and quite a, not a complete one, but yes, it does have a lot of information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simon Barber mentions um, the um, cemeteries containing the graves of uh, members of the Indian Labour Corps. And he asks, did mm -hmm. they receive any undertaking that they would not be exposed to danger as was the case with the Chinese laborers? laborers? Now, uh... As far as I know, because especially among the tribes, uh, I mean, you didn't you didn't have impressment because it was it, the as I just said the exemption of lifetime tax, the exemption from forced labor, and the chance to see the world. I mean, a lot of them simply jumped for it, and since their fathers and grandfathers just if, just uh, some of them as recent as eighteen uh, nineties had fought wars with the British because the British wanted to colonize these areas. So in a way, it, 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 they, they, they thought that they were going to war. A lot of them thought that they were being recruited as soldiers and not to do labor work, you know. And, and there are instances where men of the labor corps, because they were not given arms, and uh, especially in, in, in one of the accounts by Sai Hinga, there's this uh, section where he says when they were marching through uh, uh, through a, a town in France and, and, and the women were being, uh, I mean, th there was some firing and all that. So, uh, they asked their headmen, go and go, go to the, speak to the British officers, give us guns, we want to fight, you know. So especially among the, the, the tribes, uh, 
they, they, they were always ready to fight, but they were, not, they were the labor corps, so arms were not issued to them. I think there was no undertaking as such in the case of the Indian Labour Corps. Okay, okay. Um, and Greg, uh, Gareth Pemberton asks, uh, how, were the how were the members of the Labour Corps received by their communities when they returned? Um, thank you for a very informative presentation. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, when they came back, uh, they were uh, especially uh, the, the men of my region, the, the Lushai Labour Corps, which today is uh, Mizoram, they were in fact piped by a band party, you know, and, and all of them, since uh, in those days, money was uh, quite a, a problem. And these were very remote areas where the only source of, of money was to work in the agriculture, to work, uh, uh, to work as, a, uh, as a worker, uh, to be engaged in agriculture. So when they brought back the money, this was, a, 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 and, and I mean, this money helped them in a lot of way. And uh, the others looked up to them because they had gone and seen the world. They had seen modern civilization. As I said, this, especially for men from the Northeast, uh, from Northeast India, this was the first mass foray, the first mass contact with modern civilization. And anyone who'd seen that, they, they, they had seen planes, uh, ships, trains for the first time. You know, some of them wearing shoes for the first time. Some of them wearing trousers for the first time, you know. So it was a life-changing experience for them, and they were received very well by all the communities. Thank you. Um, and Clive Elderton says, "How significant do you consider the experience of these men from Northeast India who served in the Labour Corps? Uh, how, uh, sorry, how significant was their experience in the subsequent post-World War II freedom struggle in Northeast India?" Uh, yes, because uh, in 1970, just before the war, 1914, let's say 1910 and all, missionaries were just starting work on, on, on different areas of the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Now, immediately after the First World War, the, the number of Christian converts jumped, and by 1930s, 40s, a major, a, a, the majorities of these tribes had already converted to Christianity, and with Christianity came... The, the modern education. So by 19, uh, by the Second World War, a lot of these men, and, and since the, uh, the, one of the major theaters of the Second World War was just next door, it's just about uh, 200 miles, not even 200 miles, 150 miles as a crow flies from where I'm located. So, and, and uh, they, they, they contributed phenomenally, especially the, and the, the people from Manipur, and there was even a Lushai brigade from my region. So you, you, you had a lot of people actually fighting. In the First World War, they went as laborers. They came back, they saw, they developed. And in the Second World War, they were, they were ready as soldiers and fought the Japanese in the Burma campaign, in the Burma offensive. A lot of them lost their lives too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Smith, and uh, hello, Mark. I noticed you said hello earlier on. Um, he says, thanks for the presentation, Pratap. Was the Labour Corps run on the military lines and what was the most senior Indian rank in the Corps? Uh, the most, uh, as I said, the, the arrangements were slightly different for uh, the, the Jail and Porter Labour Corps because in the Jail and Porter Labour Corps, William Lane was the main supervisor and under him you had these, uh, con uh, you had these free warders, convict warders, and especially <clears throat> among the, the, the labor corps who went to France, uh, initially the arrangement was for about 2,000 uh, two th uh, uh, each, which would comprise a labor corps. But this arrangement was uh, later on, uh, uh, Amtil did not agree to this, but you still had the commandant and the second in command who were Euro European officers, especially for the, uh, for the labor corps from Northeast India. You had about, uh, as I said, there were supposed to be three European officers, but in most cases, they were just uh, two officers, a commandant and a second in command, and sometimes a third one also there. And, and, and the supervisors, uh, the majority of the supervisors were all Europeans and uh, even missionaries were there you, you, because you could not find enough soldiers or officers to, to, to be a part of the labor corps. So you even drafted tea planters who had no experience, you know, Okay, um, we've got a lot more questions, but I'm going to have to cut it short because some of them are just 
variations on questions that have already been answered. Um, so two people, one is Mark Smith, who just asked another question, and mm -hmm. Malcolm Spurring Toy, both ask, well, one says, what an excellent talk, thank you. Uh, but they both ask, what is a bellow blower? Which was uh, mentioned on one of your slides. Yes. Uh, you, because um, the, 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 uh, the, the Indian followers, I mean, let's say the followers, you had these different varieties of followers. You had the private followers and you had barbers, cooks, you name it, they were there. So a pillow blower is actually, when you were making armaments, the, tin, uh, uh, the, tinsmith, the tinsmither who works for making iron implements. So the one who, who blows, you know, you need to, 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 to light the fire. So you blow the pillow. I think that's the pillow blower. Okay, thank you. You blow the pillows, you, you light the fire where you can beat the iron. Okay, we'll just take a couple more. Um, ba -ba 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 Alan Atkinson has just said many thanks. What a great talk. Um, so Blake Running asks, was the, and I think you touched on this in the talk, but was the labor force affected by the influenza? Uh, yes. A, a lot of them, I think, uh, especially among the tribal, among the, 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 the labor corps from Northeast India, 30% of deaths would have been due to the, 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 the flu and the pandemic, because in these accounts of the men that I just talked about, Sainginga and, and Vompunga, they talk about death from the Spanish pandemic flu, and this is where I can infer from the accounts. Okay, thank you. Um, so with apologies to those whose questions we haven't come to, I'm just going to um, ask the final question, uh, which is a more personal one for you, Pratap. It's from Adrian Smith, and he says, did your great-grandfather earn a medal in World War I? Oh, he had this, uh, those two medals, I think you called it the Victory Medal and the, the I forgot, the, the ones uh, which, you, which is very common for everyone. Yeah. And in fact, I think I'll, uh, on a personal note there, I just, since you mentioned my grandfather, I'll just, uh, my great-grandfather. I think uh, he was, he, he saw, I, I, he saw so much bloodshed, of course, this is stories which I heard from my grandfather. Uh, once he came back, he, he, he left the army and he did not even take the pension. And he, he kind, he became kind of, a, 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 because he was disturbed by so much of, so much death. He saw that he, he visited the, 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 the holy places of India from Mizoram which is quite far from Banaras, Haridwar. He visited places like that, you know, and he was instrumental in, 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 in building one of the first places of worship for us because we're still Hindus, I'm a Gurkha. So we've, been, we've lived in, in Mizoram for 120 years, but we're still Hindus. So he was the one who built one of the early places of worship way back in the 19, after he came back from the war. Okay. Um Thank you, Pratap. Um, could I ask people again, just to raise your hands as a show of appreciation? I don't know if you can see on your screen, Pratap, but the hands are shooting up. Thank you very much indeed. Um, excellent presentation, really enjoyed that, Pratap, and it's great that we are starting to get presentations from different parts of the world. We've had Australia, we've had Canada, now we've had India. Um, so excellent, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for hearing me out and bearing me. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll contact you tomorrow, Pratap. We'll just oh. uh, pick up. Pick. But for everyone else, thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed that. Just a reminder that there'll be more webinars from the West Front Association. Uh, the next one, I think, is next Monday when uh, it's the manager of Talbot House in Poppering will be telling us about uh, Talbot House in the First World War. So I hope you can tune into that. Thanks once again to Pratap. Thanks for everybody for joining in. And this will be going up, it will be on Facebook now, but it'll be going on the YouTube channel probably in two to three weeks time. Pratap, it's whatever time it is in the morning, one o'clock in the morning for you. Thanks ever so much. Get a good night's sleep and I will talk to you tomorrow. Okay, everybody else, thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Mademoiselle from Armitage.